For this video, we're going to be looking at some of the special tests or provocation tests associated with neurologic involvement of the lumbosacral spine. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Arguably, one of the most provocative tests is the slump test. Uh, because it is so provocative, it's also incredibly sensitive. Uh, that being, it is a very good screening test to rule out neurologic involvement. However, when it is positive, uh, you have more work to do. You don't know specifically what's going on, if it's neural tension, if it's a dyspathology, or something else. So uh, for the slump test, proceed with caution. It can be very, very irritating and aggravating, and you can oftentimes have kind of a delayed onset of those symptoms or kind of a rebound effect where there's a mounting response through the neurologic symptom or system, excuse me, even after you have performed the test. So again, proceed with caution. For the slump test though, we wanna begin with our patient in a position where they are feet flat on the ground and we're gonna kinda of take a top-down approach. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ask them to bring their hands behind their back. From here, we're gonna ask that they slump into that posture that their mom, their grandma, uh, or any other individual told them really never to adopt, and so they're really gonna kinda of slouch down, fully slump into this resting position. Looks good, okay? Then from here, what we're gonna ask is that we take a side-to-side -side approach. So since we're on their right side, that's where we're gonna start. So we're gonna ask them to kick that knee out straight as much as they can. That looks pretty good. Now at this point, I oftentimes will kind of come in and just support them because it's not a test of can they hold the position, it's a test of the neurologic structures. And so at this point, they can really relax their muscles and yet I still have them in this position just by supporting the leg. I can also increase the amount of flexion here, which further tensions that neural tissue just by adjusting my leg. So once we're in this position, now we need to figure out where the tension is potentially coming from or where symptoms are exacerbated. So the first thing we can do is have the individual tuck their chin to their chest. Query, does that make things better, worse, or no different? We then can take uh, the cervical flexion out of it by having them extend up. Better, worse, no different. That's kind of the top-down approach. We can also then come to the lower leg and add several sensitizing maneuvers, such as ankle dorsiflexion, which typically will increase the sensitivity of the stretch. We can increase hip flexion. We can hip adduct, and we can also internally rotate. Now, with any of those, if symptoms are brought on, we may ask to sustain those for a moment. And so sometimes you may have to sustain ankle dorsiflexion for a little bit, as well as coming in and providing just a little bit of overpressure into that slump position. Again, with all of these though, proceed with caution. Less is more, you're looking for your comparable sign, you don't need to go kind of uh, storming past it though. All right, so that's our slump test. From here, uh, while in an exam, we would probably organize these tests a little bit differently, but for today, we're gonna go into the straight leg raise, and so for that, we're gonna ask our patient to lie down on their back. Now, once they're in this position, we're gonna bring the table up. And the straight leg raise is very, very similar to what we just saw in the slump test. Uh, many of the sensitizing maneuvers are very similar, if not the same. The difference is, is that really from the waist up, we're not uh, involving any motion. And so for this, I like to ensure that the patient is relaxed. Uh, I also want to make sure that the knee is not flexing too much or hyperextending. So oftentimes, I will take and support the ankle right above the malleoli approximate my arm right along the lateral aspect of the tibia, and then I will bring them up into this position, okay? Once I start to feel some tension through the posterior chain, that's gonna be where I slow down, and I'm gonna be watching my patient's face because they're gonna start to tell me whether or not uh, this is uncomfortable. Now, if an individual has uh, a lumbosacral radiculopathy, it's highly unlikely we're even gonna get this much range of motion, 
right? They may only get to here. Okay, so pr again, proceed with caution. But if we can get here, next we want to know, is this more of a soft tissue restriction of contractile nature, that being the hamstrings, or is this more of a neurologic issue? And so a couple things that we can do is ask where symptoms are being felt. Are they in the posterior aspect of the knee or are they in the hamstrings? As well, when we add in those sensitizing maneuvers like dorsiflexion, hip adduction, or internal rotation, do symptoms get better, worse, or no different? As well as if we bend the knee, do symptoms alleviate? Okay? Now there is one variation of the straight leg raise that bears mentioning, and that is what's known as the crossed straight leg raise. Now the crossed straight leg raise is for an individual that you suspect would have a fairly significant, oftentimes in the literature it's referred to as a massive herniation. And for these individuals, it's not a whole lot of motion at all. It's probably right about here, less than 40 degrees, only now the symptoms are not felt in the side that you're assessing, but actually in the opposite side, which is why it's this cross pattern. And the reason for that is you're tensioning the dural uh, tissue that is already being placed on a bit of uh, tension by that protrusion of the disc or by some other form of impingement. And so again, that variation is referred to as the crossed straight leg raise. Now, as we're kind of playing with the neurologic system, all of these are really referenced and referred to as neurodynamics. And so the straight leg raise falls into the neurodynamics. Our uh, slump position falls into neurodynamics. And again, all of those other pieces like ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, uh, hip internal rotation, adduction, hip flexion, even cervical flexion would be considered a sensitizing test such that we are ramping up or increasing the tension through the neural tissue. Our final test then that we want to look at is really for the femoral nerve. And so we're going to ask our patient to flip over onto their stomach. And this is referred to as the pro knee bend. Now with the pro knee bend, all we're doing is bringing the heel to the seat. Now this starts to resemble another test, uh, ELIs, which is a length uh, test for your hip flexors and quadricep. And so with this, we're not really concerned of the uh, uh, soft tissue extensibility or even whether or not the ASIS begins to lift from the table. Rather, we're looking at neurologic symptoms. So as we come into this position here, we tension that femoral nerve. If the patient would complain or report that this reproduces the numbness, tingling, burning sensation, those neurologic hallmark signs and symptoms through the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh, we would consider that to be a positive test. So again, three tests, slump, straight leg raise, and pro knee bend, all in that broader classification of neurodynamics, useful with patients who are reporting neurologic signs and symptoms, though be careful, proceed with caution, as irritability and severity is oftentimes higher with this population. Have a go with these tests and measures with a peer or colleague, and let me know if there's any questions.